You know what's the most amazing thing about Michigan's path to get here? They've never lost their edge. I mean, we saw it this week during press conferences. The players are wearing Michigan versus everyone. They like proving the doubters wrong. Now, speaking of the Terps, they had the misfortune of playing Michigan State. Seventh ranked Spartans still angry after the upset loss to Purdue last week, and they took it all out on their poor opponents. Nike didn't say how the footage would be used, and they definitely didn't explain that through split screen TV magic, Reed would match up with someone who lives in Italy. The 2017 and 2019 winner really struggled bogeying four of her first nine holes and is now in danger of missing the cut. I mean, granted, they didn't play well for pretty much most of the game, but when they were locked in those final five or six minutes, they looked fantastic. At one point in the quarter, the Pistons got a standing ovation. A bit much, but we'll allow it as the losing streak is snapped. I just want to say a big prediction tomorrow, the Lions are not going to lose, I promise you. And you know why? Aren't they they're not no play. Play. Because they're <laughs> off. There are many notable events worth celebrating. The Malice at the Palace, not one of them. Yet nearly 17 years to the day, the Pistons found themselves in another ugly brawl that's the talk of the league right now. Detroit taking on LeBron James and the Lakers. These two teams will not be sending each other holiday cards. Third quarter here is where it started. Jeremy Grant at the line makes the free throw. As that happens, James and Isaiah Stewart get tangled up. Stewart goes down after getting elbowed. He's not happy. LeBron appeared to apologize, but Stewart wasn't having it. Players trying to keep them separated. Eventually they did, but then it starts all over again. Stewart breaking free. I think he wanted Anthony Davis here. Knocked down a few people over in the process before he was stopped. His eye a bloody mess. This was a bloody mess, and it wasn't over. Stewart again charging. Not sure who he wanted, but he didn't get him. Both he and James were ejected. Pistons at the time were winning. They would go on to lose 121-116. Surprising comments afterwards from Dwayne Casey, who stood by Stewart. I don't even know if he knew who, who had hit him. Either way, ugly moment for everyone. Casey also did say he felt LeBron wasn't a dirty player. This just James' second ejection in his 19-year career. In the G League, the Gold finish off their season opening five-game road trip with a 111-93 win over Windy City. Grand Rapids will play its home opener Tuesday against the Motor City Crews. On a college basketball, fourth-ranked Michigan did not look good at all on the final game of the Roman main event from Las Vegas. Arizona pretty much doing whatever it wanted. First half, Christian Coloco with the alley-oop jam. Wildcats led by eight at the break. Pretty much more of the same in the second half. Off the turnover here, Dalen Terry taken in for the dunk. Ugly upset, 80-62. to Wolverines go down hard. Finally, football, granted it was due to an injury, but at last, the struggling Lions changed quarterbacks. Jared Goff, a late scratch with an oblique strain. That meant Tim Boyle would get his first start at Cleveland. Detroit coming off that tie last week to Pittsburgh. They hope they had now a little momentum. First quarter, it was apparent they didn't. Boyle throwing it behind DeAndre Swift, and that is an interception. First to two boy would have on the day. It would lead to a Browns touchdown. They would lead 13-0 at the half. Detroit, though, would rally. This fourth quarter field goal would get them within three. All they needed was a late stop from their defense, but it didn't happen. Browns ended up getting three first downs in their final drive to ensure Detroit never touched it again. Lions go down 13-10, but Campbell did not put any blame on his fill-in quarterback. I thought for what we asked him to do, he was solid. Well, that's one man's opinion. Boyle only had 77 passing yards on the day. Lions fall to 0-9-1. And, and that's sports. Michael Barron's coming back with your final forecast next. A few years ago at the end of a football game, I was taking pictures of the losing team as they walked off the field. Suddenly, I saw one of the players, a big senior lineman coming toward me threatening me if I didn't stop filming. I politely said I couldn't, and before there was any further interaction, he was taken away. I'm not sure how the rest of that conversation would have gone, probably not well, but I'll tell you what I would have told him. As a journalist, for good or bad, it's my job to get the story, and right now, you losing, unfortunately, is the story. I bring this up on the heels of a social media post from American swimmer Simone Manuel. Following a disappointing performance in Tokyo this week, she sent out this tweet. 
Quote, please stop interviewing athletes after a disappointing performance before they have any time to process anything. Trust me, they gave it their all, nothing else people need to know at the time. Now from a human element, I get where she is coming from, but I don't agree. It's a classic case of you can't have it both ways. Many athletes love the exposure the media gives them when things are going well. The same, however, cannot be said when it's the opposite. And that's simply not right. Asking what went wrong isn't wrong. But what's wrong here is them expecting us to act like we work in public relations and not in journalism. I'd love to hear what you think about this. Send me an email, mlissette at wzzm13.com, or find me at Twitter, at Mike Lissette. You never know what you might find inside a random storage unit. Often, it's someone's junk. But occasionally, you'll find it's someone's treasure. What I do is I have a container at home that I fill up. And when that gets filled, I bring it over here. Dan McBride has been doing this for over a decade. He's had to, since his growing collection threatened to overtake his home. I had it up in the loft and it was almost completely full. But full of what exactly? If you're expecting these boxes to contain valuable coins, cards, or even stamps, prepare to be disappointed. I called up a company that appraises sports collections and they said, we're not going to touch it. We have no idea what that's worth. But the Kent City native knows it's worth a lot. After all, inside these boxes is the story of perhaps the greatest golfer who ever lived. I have programs, newspaper articles, clippings. I have magazine covers, magazines from other countries. Dan started collecting Tiger Woods articles in the summer of 1996. This was his first one. The 96 U.S. Amateur. Now he has over 10,000. I've had people accuse me of, of obsession, <laughs> but it really was a passion. Dan says it was Tiger's competitive drive that drove him into this new hobby. But there was also another, much more personal reason. That was a divorce. He was looking for a distraction to help him get through some tough times. Tiger gave it to him. But more importantly, he also gave him hope that through perseverance, anything is possible. He had so much success, so it helped me keep my sanity. So in a way, this collection of Tiger's story is really the story of how Dan made it through. Oh my God, that's right. And ultimately, that may not be worth a lot of money. <laughs> but to Dan, it's something that's truly priceless. It was absolutely fun. Mike Lissette. 13 on your side sports. Lights out on that pace car. Jeff Striegel's job title says he's the head NASCAR radio play-by-play -play announcer. Over Kurt Busch, Matt DiBenedetto. But that is not the way he sees it. Let's, let's do it right, Mike. Let's make sure we do it right. Okay, okay. Instead, the Wyoming native views himself more as a co-anchor, which is a much more accurate description of his role. I think what makes magic for radio is the fact that all of our mics are always live. You see, unlike most sports, NASCAR and the Motor Racing Network doesn't use one play-by-play -play announcer to describe the action. Byron looking high, looking low. They use four. When we get going, we do a baton-style handoff. With the Hendrick Motorsports Chevrolet. They've got one more shot at Ryan Blaney. I'll pick up. They sort it out. They continue on. And then the others will take off behind me. One final shot off the corner. They'll try to cross over. They make it sound so easy. Along with racing legend Rusty Wallace serving as an analyst, they have two play-by-play -play announcers in the booth and two others around the track, each stationed at a corner. Now here's what's really impressive. It's all voice inflection. After a wild slide off the end of the back straightaway. And the down pitch of the voice is the cue that the next announcer's up next. Cars go to the apron in turn number one. Yup, that's right. There's no button cueing them up, or is there someone screaming in their ear to start talking? In fact, all producer Ryan Horn primarily does is make sure they make their sponsors happy. I mean, they, they're they able to carry these things, you know, with all the experience they have, they, they, have, they have it kind of locked down. The multi-play-by-play -play announcer approach actually began in 1970 when the Motor Racing Network was formed. Back then, the MRN felt NASCAR needed a shot in the arm. Well, it got one. It's intense, uh, non-stop and most of all, fun. One more run by Byron and it will come up short. Is it an art? Um, I don't know, but there is always that feeling when you know 
that the entire group gelled and you delivered the best performance possible. And when that happens, it's not only a win for them. Ryan did not let go. It's one for the audience, too. Mike Lissette, 13 on your side sports.